There we go. Good afternoon, everybody. It is one o'clock on Monday, November 28th, and that means it's time for the special edition of Higher Ed Live. I'm your host, Daniela Norton, Digital Engagement Manager at Skidmore College. On today's live broadcast, we're discussing texting students and what legal considerations you need to know if and when you decide to text your students. Higher Ed Live offers viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Live broadcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most important issues in the industry. Today's live viewing experience is powered by Maestro, the premier marketing tech platform for broadcasters. All episodes of Higher Ed Live are free and accessible in the video archives at higheredlive.com and in podcast form on iTunes. This special edition of Higher Ed Live is brought to you by Mongoose, higher education's preferred SMS texting platform. Elegantly designed and exceptionally intuitive, Mongoose is a game-changing texting solution for your entire institution. Master the art of texting with students at mongooseresearch.com. And as per usual, Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and so much more. So, now that that is out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. I want to welcome my guests today. I have Terry Taylor and Lindsay Page. I'll start with Terry first. Terry is the Senior Legal and Policy Advisors advisor from the Education Council. She focuses on projects related to access and diversity in higher education on behalf of the College Board's Access and Diversity Collaborative, the Association of American Medical Colleges and Leading Institutions of Higher Education, among others. She also works on issues related to federal accountability for colleges and universities, new models for delivering quality instruction to K-12 students, data, privacy, state assessment transitions, and educator evaluation and effectiveness. Terry earned her BA from the University of Virginia with distinction and her JD from Georgetown University Law Center. Before law school, she taught English to migrant students in Virginia and through and to seventh through 12th graders um, as a Peace Corps volunteer. So hi, Terry, thank you for joining us today. Very hi, big glad to be here. All right. And then we also have Lindsay Page, who is an assistant professor of research methodolo methodology, I'm sorry, Lindsay, uh, at the School of Education and Research, uh, at the School of Education, and she's also a research scientist at the Learning Research and Development Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Her work focuses on the effectiveness of educational policies and programs from preschool to higher ed. Much of her recent work has focused on solutions on summer melt, the phenomenon that college intending students fail to transition successfully from high school to college. Her research has been published in a variety of academic journals, and she is the co-author of a new book on summer melt published by the Harvard Education Press. Her work has been covered by Morning Edition and Marketplace on NPR um, in the LA Times. She holds a doctorate in quantitative policy analysis from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, master's degree in statistics and education policy from Harvard, and a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College. So hello, Lindsay. Thank you for joining yes. us. Hi, everybody. Really glad to be here. Thanks. So I think we did a really good job of getting the foremost experts um, on texting and um, texting for higher ed on this show. So if anybody had any questions, please feel free to ask them. I'd really like to see us try and stump these two today. See if we can... <laughs> we can make that happen. Um, for those of you who are watching along, I know there's a few that have joined us, don't hesitate to ask questions using the hashtag, hashtag higher ed live. I'll do my best um, to ask the questions as they come in and we'll save some time at the end to ask those questions. All right, so I think a good place to start, ladies, is at the very, very beginning. Um, can higher ed institutions legally text students? This one is for you, Terry. The short answer is yes, sometimes. <laughs> and we'll talk about some of the um, both legal and policy and sort of common sense things that colleges may want to think about um, when they're doing it. But the, the answer is like, yes, they can. There just may be some conditions attached. And I should say one thing to be a super lawyer for a second. This is not official legal advice. This is for policy planning purposes, but we encourage you to talk with your counsel. But this will give, we hope, some ideas both for why you might do it and um, what conditions you might need to consider. 
All right. Okay. So we're allowed to text them. Everything's going uh, along fine. We have a strategy in place, which I know we'll get to too. Um, why, why would we text students? Yeah. So um, I think I can, I think I can jump in with this one. Um, uh, with colleagues for the past several of years, I've um, implemented more text message interventions now that I can count, um, both at the high school level and at the post-secondary level. And as, as um, introduction suggested, in thinking particularly about the transition from high school to college. Um, so what um, colleagues and I have found is that text messaging, it's a short form of communication. It can be really, really useful um, when there are certain steps, certain behaviors, certain actions that students need to be taking that you want to support students to take um, in order to keep them on track with their educational trajectory. Um, so I can talk about summer melt. Um, what's interesting about that summer period between high school and college is it's a period when students need to be keeping up with a lot of different tasks. And it's a period of time when traditionally students don't um, have ready access to a counselor. Um, they may not even know that their college is sort of open in the summer. Um, and so it's a, it's a great time to be reaching out to students to help to keep them on track with all of the tasks that they need to be navigating. So in the um, text message interventions that we've implemented, we would be doing things like sending students uh, personalized, customized outreach to remind them about things like signing up for their placement tests, um, maybe afterwards understanding what their placement tests mean, registering for orientation, attending orientation, um, making sure that their financial aid is, uh, is, is all together, that it's what they need, Maybe students still in the summer or, or whenever they need to be doing this need to finish their FAFSA or um, verify the information on their FAFSA. Um, and then paying their tuition bills, setting up payment plans, making travel arrangements. So a, a lot of procedural steps that students need to take um, where maybe they may not know that they need to take that procedural step. Or maybe they just need a little nudge to stay on track with those procedural steps. You know, if we're if we're thinking about traditionally aged college students, developmentally, these students are 18 years old. We all procrastinate in our lives. 18 year olds do too, um, and so it's it's just helping them um, stay on a on a um, sort of the appropriate timetable with with all of these tasks. So particularly when there are. Um, sort of concrete and actionable things that students need to be doing. Text messaging is a great way to communicate with students, to remind them of these concrete and actionable steps. Um, and then one other thing that we have done, it's sort of a, a principle that we've adopted in our, um, in, in the text messaging interventions that we've worked on. We've used text messaging not just as a way to blast out information to students. In fact, we sort of, um, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to that, um, but my hypothesis would be that that might be less um, successful. Um, and instead, really using it as a way to be conversational with students, personalize communication with students, and um, opening up a two-way street to use text messaging as a way for students and their institution to communicate back and forth. Thank you, Lindsay. I find that really fascinating. So just to kind of break down um, what I picked up on you saying was it's really helpful to use text messaging in a personalized way, in a conversational manner, um, and for concrete, actionable items, which is really interesting to me because I tend to think, oh, I'm sitting on my phone, I'm checking Facebook, or I'm, you know, texting some of my friends. I don't know what it would be that would get me to fill out that financial aid form or to kind of switch over do you have any insight as to you know obviously it, it works um, and the idea of using your mobile which is sort of this personal and close and text messaging is um, something that you do with friends and chat and it switches over to actually be something transactional where you get work done that's right that's right so sometimes via text you can connect students to, to websites 
Um, so we've definitely done this where we can embed in text messages websites, a link to a website that a student could click on from their text message if they have a smartphone and a data plan, which most students do these days. Um, they could go right to the website that would allow them to register for their orientation. So some of those things they can do right from their phone in the moment. There are other things that we try to do, um, you know, when we send students a text message that says, hey, you need to get working on that FAFSA, the student is just is likely not going to go to fafsa.gov on his or her phone and start getting to work right when that message comes in. And so instead, we would do something like remind the student, like, this is the week you need to be working on this. Take time now to look at your calendar and set aside an hour when you're going to do this sometime soon. So it's not you know, you don't always want the sort of alarms to be going off. This has to be done now, now, now. But it's saying like, hey, we're helping to keep you on track. Take five minutes to look at your calendar and pick the time that you're going to be doing this. That makes more sense. I was like, I, I don't know if I could fill out a whole thing. <laughs> my mobile phone but I would definitely give a gold star to any student who who could make that happen yes yeah. <laughs> um, so tell us in your in your book and in your research have you seen results and is this working um, are schools actually using this to their benefit and proving summer mill yes so um, as I said um, I want to acknowledge my um, great colleague Ben Castleman who's been my partner in crime and all of this work um, so we have seen, we've run a variety of randomized trials. Um, we've seen, uh, the other organization that I should give a shout out to is U Aspire. So um, in most of the interventions that we've run, we've partnered not with, um, not with colleges and universities, but instead with nonprofit organizations that work with students in the lead up to college and in the transition to college. Not to say that colleges shouldn't be doing this work. I, I will talk about a, a partnership with a college in a, in a minute, um, in any case, in the, um, in the interventions that we've run where we've sent students sort of automated text messages, you know, about 10 to 12 messages uh, throughout the summer, automated messages that remind students about different transition topics that then serve as a way to begin conversations between the student and the organization in a more free form way. We've found that this kind of outreach um, leads to improved rates of on-time college enrollment on the order of sort of three to seven percentage points, which if you if you think about improving college enrollment nationwide by three to seven percentage points, that would really be a lot of students. Um, so the numbers the numbers may seem may feel small, but when you think about the the low cost of these kinds of interventions and what it would mean to move the needle nationwide by that amount, we're really talking about a lot of students. Um, so, um, so that's sort of intervention in the, in the transition space. We've also run interventions in the um, college retention space. So particularly around supporting students with refiling the FAFSA um, once they're in college, helping students remember that um, the joy of the FAFSA is an annual joy. Um, and they should be, obviously the timetables are changing now, but that students should be getting to their FAFSA um, once a year to refile for their financial aid. Um, we found that in nudging students via text to um, uh, stay on top of their FAFSA had particularly large impacts on um, freshman to sophomore year retention for students in community college settings. And in our mind, that, that makes a lot of sense. These might be students who are on campus less, they may see regular sort of traditional forms of communication from the college um, uh, less often. Community colleges are a little more strapped in terms of the supports that they can offer to students. So we found a really large impact there. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge one other um, intervention that I've, I've been working on, and this is a little more on the, on the cutting edge. I had said before that um, it, I, I really see it as important that the text messaging be um, two-way that it opens up a channel of communication between schools. Some colleges and universities may hear that and say like, whoa, but we don't have staff who can um, sit, sit uh, by, you know, whatever text messaging platform that you use, sit by that all day long and just wait to hear from students. Um, so in, in very recent work, I've been collaborating with a, um, a startup organization called Admit Hub. Um, they are in the Boston area. And um, we, uh, together with Georgia State University, we implemented uh, an, an intervention. We tested this through a randomized control trial 
um, that was a two-way text communication reminding students of the transition tasks that they needed to be accomplishing. Um, and then they um, infused in this communication system a chatbot technology. So when students texted in, um, it was artificial intelligence sort of smart chatbot uh, type system that could handle actually the vast majority of questions and communications that came in from students. So when when the chatbot couldn't um, couldn't sort of get to the right answer for the student, it got kicked upstairs to the real humans. Um, but this was a way to um, use this texting technology, um, uh, but also sort of reduce the um, pressure on staff to monitor it at all times. One other thing that I think is fantastic about um, having this communication come from students uh, intended college or university is that the colleges and universities really have perfect information about where students are in, in any process. So we were really able to customize communication to students. For example, if students had already registered for orientation, they didn't need to receive outreach about registering for orientation. We could really communicate with students on an, on an as needed basis and track whether students were keeping up with their transition tasks. So we did that work in, a, in the context of a randomized control trial, and there what was particularly exciting, um, exciting from a like data nerd standpoint, um, is that we were really able to track the impacts that we were having on student success in navigating each of these um, process steps that culminated in timely enrollment. So it was really the first time from a research standpoint that I had the ability to track students in such a step-by-step -step manner. That is super interesting um, and definitely fodder for an entire book, I think. <laughs> I really, that, there's, so, there's so much to unpack there. One of the things you talked about, though, was um, which is smart, is using these third-party systems and these third-party vendors um, to do this automated because I I just, I think of all the staff and all our admissions counselors um, and they travel on the road and just, you know, enrollment and how many students at huge universities like University of Pittsburgh, um, that it would be, it would just be a full-time job. So I guess maybe we slide over to Terry and talk about third-party vendors and the legality sort of behind um, what we can give these vendors and um, privacy issues, um, you know, where, where do we even start? Terry? <laughs> well, the place to start, I think, is thinking about the kinds of things Lindsay said, like what's the purpose of using the text message? You know, what is what are they trying to achieve sort of educationally or informationally? And what are the outcomes that are sought? I think that that can also help. A lot of schools are doing inventories right now of all the communications they send to their students. And I love that Lindsay said, basically, this isn't an email substitute. <laughs> it's not like, you know, if students don't check email, they can then check their texts to get the same information. So I really like the idea that texting is a particularly helpful tool when used in this way. So I think that's great. So I think that the first place is just why are you texting and who's involved? Um, and so then once you know why, there are a couple of big questions that at least from a federal um, legal perspective, you should think about. Um, one um, is personally identifiable information or education records being used. So things that are about the student uniquely um, that could include their social security number, it could in, in include their uh, grades or test scores or their progress, like any records that the institution is maintaining about the student for purposes of their education there, um, that can qualify. So if that's involved, then it can trigger some consent requirements. But even if it involves those, uh, that sort of personally identifiable information, um, you can still use it. It's just, you might have to make sure it fits certain conditions. And you also just need to take care of when parental or the student consent might be required. Now, there are some pretty important exceptions here that many of the things that Lindsay described could fit under. I think one of those is uh, if the, a third party is helping an institution maintain its own data and communication services. So it's a third party helping the institution for itself. I should say, if the institution itself is just communicating with its students using its own internal systems, many of these rules actually don't apply because it's about the institution communicating to its student. Um, and so that can be important for lots of things that I'll get into in a minute. But um, if it's a third party helping with this institution's own systems, you need an agreement that explains the necessity of this kind of uh, uh, use of texting and this sharing of student data. 
Um, you need to make sure that the third party is under the direct control of the institution for the collection and maintenance of data. So it's not like the institution is never checking in <laughs> on this. It's not like, it's, so just making sure that, that, that it's actually the institution that's in, in control of these records, not a third party. Um, that the personally identifiable information or student data is only used for the purpose that they've agreed to. And so, so again, this is sort of common sense stuff, but it's important to work that out. And it's really important to have that written down somewhere so that you've agreed to it. Um, I'll say with texting, some of these may be uh, a sort of a texting only agreement, but particularly to the extent this may be you know, a broader third party that has a suite of services for the institution, it's important to make sure that they've thought through how the texting specifically might implicate this or not. So just you know, have your lawyers look at it. <laughs> is 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 the is is the agreement there? And that's not a plug for the legal community, but just what the law says. Um, there's also separate um, uh, exceptions for parental consent when researchers are involved. And again, a written contract is required for this between the research organization and the institution. Um, the the personally identifiable information needs to be available to researchers that have a direct and legitimate interest in that information. So Lindsay, not Lindsay's random physics colleague at the University of Pittsburgh, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so uh, you need to make sure that there's no public release of the personally identifiable information. The aggregate information might be published and released in a study. Researchers have an interest in that kind of thing. But it needs to make sure there's a difference between um, the thing that can be traced back to an individual student and the sort of aggregate outcomes. That can be particularly important, though, when you have a small N size. So if you have a texting program that implicates 15 students and two of them are freshmen, that might be personally identifiable information. So you need to make sure you have an understanding of when is your group of students enough that you can't figure out who the individual student is. Um, the data that's identified needs to, for researchers needs to only be related to the purpose stated in the contract with the institution, and the data has to be destroyed when the study is over, basically. So for researchers, there's, there's some pretty broad exceptions here, um, but it, they have a little more specific um, requirements because their purpose is a little different than a third party working directly for the institution. Um, so that's some of the questions. Um, a couple of big red flags, though. You can't use students' personally identifiable information for commercial or marketing purposes without the student's consent. So if you're working with a third party and they want to use the information to advertise maybe some, I don't know, um, some other kind of consulting service, they can't do that unless the student has specifically opted in or their parent has opted in for them. Um, it, you also can't use the information to inform employment decisions. Um, this could be employment even on the on campus, um, but you can't use the information that's gathered for this texting purpose to um, inform sort of a hiring decision, again, without the student's consent. And again, it's not like you can't ever do some of these things. It's just you need to take the extra step of getting affirmative consent when commercial or marketing purposes are involved or for when you know employment decisions might be involved. And this is from a federal perspective. <laughs> I can talk about states in just a minute. That was a lot. Sorry to be a lawyer on a Monday afternoon. <laughs> Get all of those gems out on. I was, it was a lot. I was trying to get all of those gems out on Twitter um, while you were typing them up. So I'll make sure to to tweet these out. Um, and uh, I, I can tweet out too. Um, our friends at the Data Quality Campaign um, have put out a lot of great resources, um, including one that's literally a document that actually my group helped with that um, has stoplights. <laughs> that's that's very easy to understand. So you know, if this situation, you know. Can institutions do it, or do they need to take some extra steps? Um, I should also say um, some of these, there are some exceptions too for if you want to share student information from one education institution to another. So for example, from a high school to a college, that's allowed. If you want to share information relating to a student's financial aid package, that can also be allowed. And so there's there's lots of things that FERPA is not like is actually pretty sensitive to some of the unique ways that student data gets used. And even though it was originally written in the 70s, in many ways it's held up over time. That's that's how you know it's a good law, right? Because if it, yeah. <laughs> if it can stay, you know, yeah. if it can hold up over 30 years, 40 some years, then it doesn't need to change. <laughs> It's also complicated. So a lot of people are like, what the heck is this thing? <laughs> Let's just leave We're it. We're not going to mess with it. Yeah. Too funny. So you um, mentioned, I think, I think everybody um, plays well with FERPA, but on the state level, what are some of the differences? Mm -hmm. 
So FERPA hasn't changed in a while. There's been some different regulations and some different guidance. Um, so from a federal level, federal applies to everybody that takes federal, um, so basically most institutions. Um, many states, though, particularly in an absence of a lot of federal activity and change, have taken some of their own steps. And some of their um, things they've been particularly concerned about are third parties. So um, some states have taken measures to restrict the type of data that can be collected. Um, there's particular concerns about what's called biometric data. So health records, uh, you know, fingerprints, that kind of stuff, um, there's some concern about. There's also some concern about um, using data for uh, predictive analytics. So all the cool stuff that data nerds and researchers and policy people are like, this is so cool, you can do this intervention, you can change the achievement gap. There's actually some concerns about sort of 1984-ing our students. And so I think you see some states coming out of like that. Um, the state that's considered the most sort of um, that's been a leader on student privacy for a long time is California. And in uh, 2014, they passed SOPIPA, uh, so, which is another long acronym for basically another uh, student privacy um, bill. Importantly though, that California bill doesn't apply to higher education. Um, however, some other states, like I think Illinois is one, have used that framework to um, also apply to higher ed. And it, it specifically talks about when not when the education institution itself is using student data, but what ha there are some extra requirements for third parties. And that's particularly outlining when student or parent consent is required, but also what happens if there's a breach. Uh, data breaches are nobody's favorite thing, but some states have um, become a lot more specific about who's responsible, who's on the hook for damages, and importantly for colleges and universities to understand, again, sorry to be doom and gloom lawyer, like it, even if the third party breaches, the institution itself may be liable for some of that. So it's important to know that there are some state laws that can change this, that federal law hasn't gone there yet. Um, there have been some kind of copycat bills that federal law would go after, but I th th that would mirror the California approach. But some states um, likely have more uh, things going on. And for example, in 2015, almost 200 bills were introduced across states. And of those, 125 had some kind of restrictions for student data. Um, a lot of them also talked about the governance. So how does the state itself um, oversee student data, data privacy and that kind of thing? So I just want to segue and bring Lindsay back into this because I imagine you had to use all of this data. Did you come across any issues in, in getting this and, and legal issues when you were writing your book and doing your research? No, so um, I think I think um, it, it may be that some of our earlier studies sort of preceded more more recent laws, particular to text message communication. Um, so I would actually be interested in um, hearing more about that. Um, in general, uh, I've worked with organizations that um, have been very good about um, soliciting students' contact information, you know, their cell phone number in particular, and at that time, seeking students' permission to communicate with them via text message to be very clear about, um, you know, by giving us the cell phone number, you are agreeing to communication via text message. And then one other thing that um, we always do in our, in our interventions um, and this is, this is, I think, an important lesson for any organization that's interested in using text messaging for students. Um, the first message that goes out to students really has to tee up for students, who is it that's reaching out to them? Why are they reaching out to them? You know, whose phone number is this that I'm, that I'm hearing from? What person is it that I'm hearing from? And um, making clear, you know, in our, in our introductory messages, we always say, this is so-and-so from you Aspire or from whatever organization. I'm texting you to provide you support with transition from high school to college. And then we always give them specific instructions on how to opt out. So it would say like standard texting rates apply so that you, you get that information out there. And then um, including something like if you don't want this text outreach, simply reply stop and, and it will shut it off. And we've always worked with systems that um, can read that incoming message. If a student writes back stop, they'll automatically be canceled out of the, of the engagement. Um, so um, that's, those are sort of general operating principles that we have um, uh, operated within. 
and always having sort of a two-step consent process. One, um, by giving us your cell phone number, you're giving preliminary consent. And two, when we begin the outreach, we, we instruct them on how to, how to opt out during the course of the outreach if they, if they choose to do so. I see you nodding over there, Terry. Um, it seems like she did everything right. <laughs> Well, Say yes. I, I can't know for sure, but, <laughs> uh, but it does, it does like, this is a great example of how, you know, the law might not make you get consent every single time, but from a practical perspective, if you want to get the education outcomes you want, asking for consent might be helpful because otherwise, you know, if students aren't paying attention to this text message, or they're mad that you're still texting, um, you might not get the education result that you want. And so I think it's a, this is a great example of how, yeah, there are some, federal considerations, but I think it's more important to think about educational reasons and like what experience you want the student to have and then kind of go from there. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, we've talked about summer melt, we've talked about retention, but I feel like a lot of schools use texting in emergency situations, maybe more than anything else. And before we went live, we were talking about um, Ohio State today and how they were communicating using social media and text messages. Um, are there any legal considerations there that we need to think about in, in times where it really is crisis? Uh, well, FERPA allows for this too, when there's um, a federal, a, a sort of a, not a federal, there's a, an emergency, a safety issue, or maybe a medical emergency. Um, um, there are some exceptions to that as well. And so it has to be sort of imminent or, um, or, or actually currently occurring harm, but FERPA allows institutions to um, use personally identifiable information to even share it with emergency responders and that kind of thing, if it's, if it's important to know. So you could see how that kind of thing could be important. But again, for, for just like sending a text from a, a university to its students that there's um, an emergency they need to understand, like that likely doesn't fall under FERPA because it's just an institution communicating with its own students using what is probably considered an educational record. So your phone number or your name or your address, all of those kinds of things actually don't qualify as education records. It's considered directory information. <laughs> so there's, um, I don't need to get into the specifics of this, but the, the good news is, is that there, there aren't, when, when it needs, when a message has to go out and a text might be the best way to alert an, a university community about an emergency situation, um, there's clear legal grounds there for, um, for, for universities to, to proceed with that. So I think we saw a good example of that today. Unfortunately, you don't want to see good examples of this because it means something bad's happening, but uh, I, I, Ohio State, I think, was able to use that and help the community get to safe locations and out of the harm's way. Yes, very smart and a very good job of keeping people um, informed, which needs to happen, which kind of leads me to um, another question in accountability with text messaging. So we were throwing around this idea in an admission scenario, if you decide to do your decision letters out, um, uh, but you know, our college is held accountable for everything that goes out through text message. And, and Terry, you told me, you know, use your common sense on this one, Daniela, most likely um, these institutions will be held accountable for the things that go out there. I'm assuming that is the same for if these students opt out too. If they choose to hit stop on that reply message and opt out, um, we're held accountable for making sure that they're no longer communicated with, right? It's, I mean, yes. I think that for, for now at least, um, the means of communicating is less important than some of these other questions about, you know, what information is being used and how is it being shared and whether it comes out as an email or a phone call or text message, same rules of the road likely apply. Um, I, I will say there that there are some questions I think about how to make data privacy work in our new digital age and new ways of communicating. And so um, even if there isn't a specific state or federal law in place, um, I think it's important for understand there are public concerns about the use of student data and information. And your, your cell phone is a very personal thing. Like it's, it's on your person, it's in your bag all the time. And um, though there are clear ways you can text, um, I think it's important to be aware of some of the concerns about privacy. And this gets to sort of a public accountability kind of thing that um, if, it's, if it's misused, if you're you know, texting students something that um, is inaccurate information, um, you might not get sued under FERPA 
Um, and FERPA actually doesn't allow for damages necessarily, um, but some state laws do. Uh, but you might lose some credibility. And so when I hear, when I think about accountability, I think it's important to, to use common sense, but also think about it um, from the perspective of the student, but also from folks that might question um, the use of technology to improve education out outcomes and just be able to e explain why. So that's why Lindsay's guidance about make it personalized, allow for, you know, you know, inner stop to in messages, those kinds of things are just smart to, to make sure you're using texting at, to, to be as good of a tool as possible. That's actually a really good segue because one of the things we were talking about before we went live too, um, and I think it was Lindsay who said this was, you know, the devil's really in the details um, with how often you want to text and what you're texting about, because I think it's probably really easy to turn these students off based on all the things Terry was saying, that it is personal, that you do carry it with you all the time, you know, um, that it, their phone is always on you. So um, maybe, Lindsay, you can unpack some of, some of the details that are devilish for us. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and that, that really comes out of, um, you know, in, in all of the text messaging interventions that we've run, um, especially in the, in the startup phase of working with an organization to plan and, and get something off the ground, um, it, the idea of reaching out to students via text message, it sounds so deceptively simple, um, but there's really a lot um, that needs to be figured out. How are you going to frame the messaging to students? Um, who's, who's the ostensible sender, even if there's some sort of automated communication that's going on? Um, how, what are you actually going to say in the messages? And what are the, um, when are the messages going to go out? I worked with one school district that decided um, they were texting their seniors and they decided that their students couldn't receive text messages during the school day. And so 6 a.m. on a school day morning was when they decided their messages could be going out. We had, we had great outcomes there. I was surprised too. Um, but um, you, so there, there are a lot of details like that that you, that you really need to think about. Um, you know, a few, a few guidelines that I would offer, um, you really want to be careful about not um, sort of barraging students with messages every day. Um, so you really want to pick and choose. Um, in most of the interventions that I've run, um, we haven't reached out to students more than about once a week. Um, sometimes when we're just getting off the ground, we might send out two messages a week, one that's like an introduction, here's what we're going to be doing, and one that's more substantively focused. Um, and you really want to be very uh, action-oriented. Really try to cue the student on what's the behavior, what's the action, what's the step that you're looking for. Even if the step that you're looking for is for the student to respond to a message to say, to, to share with you how they're doing or whether they've started something. One thing that we found in an intervention, you know, say you want a yes, no response from students. Um, we found that we were able to increase student responsiveness by in, in our text message, asking the yes, no question, and then appending at the end, yes or no. And just appending that yes or no, really, really making it quite clear to the students, here's the thing that I'm looking for. Um, that increased student responsiveness. Um, so, so really try to really try to be clear with students about that the action that you're looking for, the behavior that you're trying to induce, um, and making sure that you're not using this channel of communication so much that students become sort of numb to it, that they're more willing to to ignore it because because it's coming to them too often. Yeah, I think the the less is more and use that strategy um, purposefully and with intent really makes a difference when you're communicating um, with these students. I just imagine they get so many text messages. Yes, Terry, I, I, I see I see her finger went up. <laughs> uh, it also and I'm, I'm drawing from another I'm not a researcher, but I read a lot of research. Um, the way that messages are constructed can be really important as well particularly if it's an intervention that is about kind of a, a, a delicate situation. So there are some interesting studies about wording letters about academic probation in a way so the student doesn't feel like it's their fault and that they're being called out for being a disappointment, but saying, you know, we're here to help you, um, you know, continue to, you know, achieve at this institution. So I, I love what Lindsay said about just make sure you're thinking about how many you're sending and that kind of thing. But even the way things are worded, um, folks that have done some mindset research um, like David Yeager and folks like that, um, 
have some pretty interesting guidance, I think, for institutions because words matter a lot, and um, particularly when it's a thing in your pocket that you're picking up <laughs> next, you know, in the same device that you call your mom on. So I think uh, there's some interesting research there as well. I don't know if Lindsay, you, you know more about that. Um, yeah, so the, the work that you're citing is work by, um, I'm not sure who the lead author is, David Yeager's definitely involved, it's like Greg Walton and Jeff Cohen out at Stanford, um, uh, you know, folks like Carol Dweck, that, that whole um, team of folks um, have done fantastic research and, and we found um, something similar, in fact, in, um, in one intervention that um, we were conducting um, where we were reaching out to students while they were still in high school, we began with messages that were really chock full of really detailed kind of dense information. And as we went along with the intervention, we had this sort of like soul searching conversation where we said, really, all of, all of, there's so much complexity wrapped up in this. What we really want to do is engage the students in a dialogue where we can let that information that they need to have come out more piecemeal through a conversation. And so we decided to scale back the, the density of the messages and really instead focus on how can we structure these messages so that we increase the likelihood that we'll sort of hook students into a conversation and then be able to carry the thread of a conversation where they can actually get some really um, in-depth advising. So I think you really want to think about, you know, that was an intervention where we, where we actually, we were reaching out to kids across the country we um, employed advisors full time where it was their job to be texting with high school students basically full time. Um, so we really had the capacity to um, engage students via text in very detailed um, conversations. For another institution, that may not be feasible. Um, and so you really want to think about, um, you know, is our primary goal to hook a student into a conversation? Is our primary goal to uh, make sure that we get some information their hands but still be here if they want to follow up with a question. I think all of those sort of um, logistical and staffing features um, really um, should shape um, the, the exact content and, and style of the messaging. Go ahead, Terry. <laughs> uh, so, Lindsay, you didn't know this, but you just set up perfectly this thing I wanted to say about a Supreme Court case. And because I think one thing, I don't know how, how much it's been studied and I don't know how common it is now is to use texting to help inform either peer mentors or faculty advisors to sort of be a official representative, but it's not something that's as structured as some of the things we've talked about here. And um, th the good news is, is that actually there's Supreme Court precedent um, from 2001. So it was a little while ago before the dawn of smartphones. Um, but the Supreme Court unanimous unanimously said that peer grading didn't count as an educational record. So, um, and so the, the, the link here is that if it's not something that's going to go in a student's file, if it's just somebody from, if it's a teacher or a mentor or a peer, um, that kind of thing doesn't necess isn't necessarily governed in the same way that some of these other um, texting interventions that we've talked about, they're kind of an official university message. And so as you're looking for partners in some of this and people to follow up on, um, they're, they're, if you're working in the construct of an institutional program, um, you can then uh, not necessarily have to go through some of the hoops for some of these peer advisor or faculty advisor texting interventions. So in an effort to sort of spread the love around um, from beyond the admission office and beyond the student affairs office. Um, there may be some other folks that if you train them the right, right way, give them some examples about messaging and frequency and that kind of thing, you might be able to help them. Cause I think um, study after study shows that having a mentor or somebody or an adult on campus who cares about you um, can have huge effects. And so I'm now getting into a, a you know, big fat research agenda, but I think there are ways for institutions to be really smart about this and find some other partners in it, even if they don't have the capacity within the sort of designated office. Yeah, absolutely. And Lindsay, you mentioned you're um, adding yes or no, you know, to the end of a text message. Are there any other tricks or words um, or instances that you've seen that worked really well that kind of get to, to Terry's point here? Um, you know, that's the, maybe that's my, maybe that's my go-to example. Um, I think that there are other, um, other things that you can do, you know, if you want students to, um, you, if you want to sort of plant a seed for a student about a deadline that's coming up, um, a lot of research in the space of behavioral economics will, will say that 
if you not only tell students, hey, that thing is due on January 13th, um, instead of just saying January 13th, if you say to student, a student, that's due on Friday, January 13th, it helps the students sort of like visualize or peg that date um, more specifically in their mind. Um, and so just sort of changing the way that you convey date information to students um, can, can have uh, positive impacts. I think there are other things, you know, there's a whole huge literature on, you know, kind of like Terry, um, you know, said like, oh, we're skating on a gigantic literature here. There's a, there's a huge literature on um, framing in, in behavioral economics. So how you frame something to students in terms of the potential benefit of um, filing their FAFSA to say, you know, your FAFSA is due on this date, great. Or you could say to the student, your FAFSA is due on this date. Don't miss out on that $5,000 that you qualified for. Um, so it, in a way, it feels a little um, uh, like sort of getting into the space of marketing. Uh, but, you know, I have, a, I have a colleague here at Pitt who says like, oh, it's, you know, catchy to call things behavioral economics now. Like everybody likes that phrase, but really it's marketing. And we've been doing marketing for a really long time. And so, you know, maybe for a college or university, like maybe the answer is for the admissions office to like march over to the marketing department and say like, help us a little bit with our, with our messaging. Like how do we, um, and you know, that's gonna be important whether you're texting or sending emails or, or whatever it is. Like what we're talking about here is communicating with students in effective ways. And so text messaging is one channel of communication that we found to be um, really fruitful, at least for now. Um, but I think it, it's, it, this kind of work should be situated in a, a broader context of um, not just that we communicate, but how we communicate really, really matters. And so we should be thoughtful about uh, the communication that we throw out to students. I love that. I just want to make another plug from a marketer. All of your admissions people out there, walk over to the marketing office. Ask for help with this messaging. You heard it here from Lindsay. No. <laughs> we should do this. That's that's great. That's great advice, I think, across the board. And something that um, any chance offices get the chance to collaborate and, and cross-plan, they absolutely should. So one of the things in listening to you talk about this that I remember reading um, from Mongoose, the sponsor, was was to stop using periods in text messaging. Apparently putting a period at the end of a text message is like a huge no-no and uh, students don't use, you know, millennials don't use periods. It's a very serious um, instance when you use a period in a text message. So I can pass that along to anybody who's interested in that. And I think that about wraps up our show. We're nearing, we've got, it's about 1.47. Um, they have a few viewers in, I don't have a ton of questions from Twitter and I'm trying to look through our questions, ladies. Did I miss anything that we didn't get a chance to talk about? I feel like we really unpacked and had a really great conversation, but I am willing to throw it out to you all if there's anything that we missed. Terry, are you feeling good too? Yeah. Yes. All right. And well, for the first time in all of history, the lawyer doesn't have some more to say. <laughs> That's too funny. Awesome. Well, thank everybody for um, for joining us today. I hope you all learned something. I saw there was a little bit of traffic on the back channel and we tweeted out um, using the hashtag higher ed life. So follow along and we'll be sure to share this episode too um, once it's been recorded. Just uh, another thank you to our program sponsors, Mongoose and M Stoner. Um, check higheredlive.com for the upcoming episodes, including um, the special edition episodes, but as always our admissions, advancement, marketing, and student affairs channels. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Higher Ed Live and sign up for the weekly newsletter to stay up to date um, on all things higher ed in the next episodes. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks so Bye. much.